Altair Ibn Lahad. Arguably one of the most iconic video game characters of all time. Even if just for his iconic silhouette, Altair is the catalyst for the billion dollar franchise that Assassin's Creed is today. When the first Assassin's Creed game came out, the front of the box didn't have the city of Damascus or the Masyaf stronghold, it simply had this dude on the front. A hooded man standing out from the crowd with a blade in hand, looking calm and composed. For a kid in 2007, this was their dream come true. However, once players picked up the game, there were criticisms to be made. Underneath the hood, Altair was called uninteresting as a character. His story in Assassin's Creed 1 was called repetitive and straightforward, which some thought left him as simply a vessel for the player. The awesome design and aesthetic Altair brought to the table seemed to paint a very different picture from the Altair that players met, which led to the aggressive pivoting towards a more fun, energetic and engaging storyline with Assassin's Creed 2. Now of course Altair did go against the archetype of the assassin character in fiction. He was colder and less charismatic than the character Ezio would go on to be, but was he a bad character? or simply one that was too different from what players expected, and they just needed to adjust to it over time. That is what we're here to find out today, with a deep dive into the character of Altair, across his appearances in Assassin's Creed 1 and his triumphant return in Revelations, with passing mentions of Assassin's Creed 2 and Bloodlines along the way. With that said, Welcome back to my Assassin's Creed character study series, where we take a deeper look into the protagonists of Assassin's Creed. So far, we've taken a look at Ezio, Edward, Arno, Connor, Jacob, Evie and Lydia, with a detour looking at Freedom Cry, the Tyranny of King Washington and the Jack the Ripper expansions. Blimey. As always, we'll start with the character and design, the story and setting and finally conclude with my thoughts on how the character was implemented. If you're new to the series and you want to check out the previous entries, the card is on screen now for you to take a look, and don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on the latest uploads. Today we're looking at the legendary Altair Ibn Lahad, as voted for by you, and beating Shea by quite a large margin. Altair was the living embodiment of the creed, growing up as an assassin, rebelling against their ways, and ultimately finding his purpose and a reason to follow the words the assassins preach. Altair went on to lead the Brotherhood and spread their influence around the globe, and giving his life for a creed that he fully believed in and became an influential figure as his knowledge was passed down throughout history and aided in the many struggles to come. And so without further ado, let's begin. Born in 1165 to assassin parents, Altair grew up as part of the Levantine assassins and never knew a life outside of it. Because of his intensive training and lifestyle, he became the youngest assassin to be granted the rank of master, until he began to lose his way and had to serve Al Mualim without his rank to earn it back, something he achieved with ease, and after uncovering a sinister plot to control the Holy Land, he killed Al Mualim and claimed the title of mentor. Altair's personality is unlike the assassins that succeed him. He is much colder and more arrogant in his youth, being demanding and impatient towards others. When Altair was a child, his mother died during childbirth, and his father was tragically killed by the Saracens. After a man named Ahmed was tortured and revealed his identity, and at only 10 years old, Altair had to witness the man take his own life in front of him, because he felt so guilty of his actions. This led to Altair growing up without a father figure, and turning to Al Mualim instead, admittedly not a great replacement. Altair grew up under the strict conditions of the assassins, and was honed as a weapon from the moment he stepped foot in Al Mualim's hands. It's for this reason that Altair is less caring and empathetic compared to the other assassins. He's more of a mindless drone, and the events of Assassin's Creed 1 see his instincts take over as he breaks free from this programming and realises what he wants from his life outside of the Creed. 
As many of you will know, Altair's name derives from the constellation Aquila, where the brightest star is referred to as al Nir al Hair, in Arabic meaning the flying eagle. Eagles are a classic motif that will carry through the AC franchise, right down to the very logo of the game being an eagle's skull, or the eagle vision that the characters possess. For the first game, according to Jay Raymond, the series' eagle symbolism came about when the Assassin's Creed creative team realised the Assassin's predatory nature was akin to a bird of prey, and the rest of Altair's design philosophy spiralled from there. Altair's surname Ibn Lahad translates to Son of No One, telling us a lot about how Altair fully embraced the Creed and rejected his family name. However, in AC Revelations, Altair proudly addresses himself as the son of Umar, his father, therefore making his actual name Altair ibn Umar. When Altair eventually goes on to have his son Darium, he too continues to use the name son of no one, meaning that this could be something more akin to the term hidden one that Bayek first used, and is more a representation of the character's devotion to the assassins as familial figures. In terms of design, let's look at Altair's signature robes. In fitting with the drone mentality, Altair wears the same outfit as the other assassins of the time, albeit a master assassin alternative. While there were some exceptions to how the outfit was designed, all of the Levantine assassins fit the same design theory. Altair not having anything to distinguish his outfit as uniquely his is in keeping with the ways that free will was kept from him, and we relate more to his need to be himself and be free from the corrupt teachings of al Mualim as the story of AC1 continues. Assassin's Creed, and therefore Altair's outfit, started as an extension of the Prince of Persia franchise. However, as the team realised the potential of assassins as a concept, the outfit was drastically changed to resemble more of a hero archetype, and one made for a new kind of game. His design portrays a conflict of ideas and contrary goals. Assassin's Creed is a franchise with the Brotherhood at its centre, a paradoxical order of men and women bound together to promote peace, and yet find themselves becoming murderers to carry out this vision. They wage a war against men that try to create rules that cling to their traditions and tenets. This isn't something the franchise is prepared to ignore, and through Altair's design, it strikes this moral greyness from the offset, and a philosophy that defines the core of what the Assassin's Creed games should be. It's for this reason that Altair's robes are themselves a paradox. Altair is cloaked in layered robes with a hood that is close to his face, and keeps him shadowed, and yet his outfit is a stark white colour that defies an attempt at stealth. However, this was of course intentional. Once we have a wider context of video games in the late 2000s, specifically how brown had become a very prominent colour scheme even in the Prince of Persia games, this was an era where gritty realistic shooters like Gears of War and Call of Duty toned back on the vibrancy and tried to show the realism that video games could bring to their audience. Assassin's Creed was genius in this regard, because although the game itself has a desaturated and bleak colour scheme, the central character always cuts through this bleakness, and grabs your attention. Imagine walking through a local game shop, and seeing a lot of the covers that look the same, and then you see a character that stands out. And you think about how this character could possibly be an assassin while dressed in pure white. And already you're hooked. The truth is that Altair's white colour scheme was made to fit his personality better. He is arrogant and bold. Why would this character ever want to stick to the shadows? For that reason, Assassin's Creed never incorporated hiding mechanics like Thief, where the shadows make you invisible, but instead, you blend in with the crowd, and use the social setting and bustling streets to manoeuvre around. Or use the rooftops, where the glistening sun will mask your appearance, I've seen some mods for Assassin's Creed 1 where Altair was given black robes, and my only question is, which do you think stands out more here? And suddenly the question of why Altair is dressed in white makes much more sense. The idea wasn't for players to hide, but instead, to move. As a character, Altair is focused, and his outfit follows similarly. Whilst original concepts showed a more romantic look for the character, the final design shows incredible efficiency. 
When in low profile, his silhouette is very small and narrow, perfect for remaining incognito as his robes stay relatively close to the body, and his upper torso has straps that keep any material from moving. However, it's in high profile that Altair's outfit quite literally reveals itself. Where the long robes created a dramatic and statuesque profile, when in action, they show more dynamic movement, as the lower portion of his robes are revealed to be segmented, and thus, when Altair is running, they spread open like an eagle's wings, and allow his legs to have the full range of movement when sprinting away from guards. This communicates to the player the visual differences between being in low profile and high profile, so they would always know which state Altair was in. Later appearances of Altair's costume as an unlockable outfit from Assassin's Creed 3 onwards had a very major issue, where the sections of Altair's robes do not have their textures mapped individually, and so the back of the outfit will remain closed when running, which can cause the outfit to stick to the back of the character's legs, and not have the intended effect. This is even present in Altair's appearance in Revelations, where the robes were updated and glued to Altair, reducing the fluidity and motion in his movement. I'd say the closest to recapturing the magic was probably Unity, which did assign unique physics to the front sections of the robes, and allowed the suit to open up when in high profile, although this could be due to Thomas de Carnelian being a character in the game that used very similar robes to Altair's, and so it's simply an accident that Altair's robes ended up getting such high quality treatment. Altair's hood is arguably the most iconic part of his outfit. The hood went on to define Assassin's Creed as a franchise, and an assassin without it never feels the same. Altair's hood is unique in the way that it wraps close to his face, and keeps his identity the best cloaked out of any in the series, and it's only in contrast to the more relaxed hoods later in the series that we can see how Altair fits more of a soldier than an individual. The beak extruding from the top of the hood once again carries over the eagle symbolism. An eagle's beak is shaped in a way that it can tear off flesh from its prey, making it a threatening addition that resembles a hook, warning others not to come near. Although Altair's outfit is white, he does have a few notable colour differences, such as a striking red belt. As I've said in other essays, the belt acts as a reminder of the violence he can inflict at any time, whilst Altair, more than any other in the series, was made to have more mystical overtones to his appearance, it should never be forgotten how quickly this can turn to violence, once he finds his target and all hell breaks loose. When Altair is stripped of his rank, he loses a lot of the additional elements of his final design, for a more basic look, and over time he earns these pieces back, which adds a nice progression to the outfit, as he is further disciplined. It's noted that Altair was designed to be unlikable at first, and so his outfit represents his conflicting personality with its clashing visual cues. However, this also shows Altair slipping back under Al Mualim's control. It's only in hindsight when we see the evil actions of Al Mualim that we fully come to understand the sinister undertones that Altair rejoining the Creed has had. However, that's not to say that, that this progression of the outfit is a slip into evil. It's quite the opposite, as we see Altair learn all the right messages but for the wrong reasons, which were completely out of his control. Altair symbolically builds back up his identity through the pieces of his costume coming back together, but in his image and not as a drone of Al Mualim, instead becoming aware of the corruption. This increased knowledge and discipline is reflected in his apparel as a slow build-up of his weaponry and armoury shores. For Altair's weapons, of course we have the iconic Hidden Blade, the biggest staple of the franchise and one that became a recognisable symbol for years to come, from the unique design and its implementation. Altair's Hidden Blade was designed by Darius in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. We're not going to talk about that. Which was made to be a wrist blade that was visible to onlookers, before Aya and Bayek modified the design to fit underneath the arm for a more secretive implementation for assassination, even if it wasn't designed that way. To make this design work, it required the removal of the user's ring finger, so the blade could push through whilst having a clenched fist, 
but also by removing the ring finger, it would confirm the commitment the wearer had to the creed, and therefore relationships and marriage were not allowed. This design would be rectified by Altair himself, who, using the Apple of Eden, learned to change the blade to no longer require a sacrifice, and going forward assassins would instead brand themselves at the point where the finger would be cut off, to symbolise the same kind of marriage of sorts. And you may be thinking, hang on a minute, in the movie, Aguilar cuts his finger off. And yes, that's because the movie is wrong. Whilst this covers the majority of Altair's appearances, there are a few additional outfits to cover. The armour of Altair is an unlockable in Assassin's Creed 2, tied to the main story, in which Ezio must collect six seals to unlock the armour underneath his villa in Monteregioni. This armour was designed by Altair to resist the physical damage the Apple of Eden could inflict, should it ever fall into the wrong hands again. Whilst the armour doesn't resemble Altair's frame, and appears tailor-made to Ezio, we know that Altair could use the apple to look into the future, which is how he constructed the hidden gun, and therefore could have purposefully made the armour to fit Ezio and aid him in his fight in the Vatican. In later life, Altair returns to the assassin stronghold, and reclaims the title of Mentor, his outfit being a stark contrast to Almoalem's by being a stark white showing the purity and knowledge Altair had gained from the apple across the years of researching it. Unlike Altair's main outfit, this one is unique to him, and a symbol of his individuality, as he ascends to an almost mythical status among the assassins, that murmured and rumoured about his survival. This outfit has no weapons visible, since Altair would be no longer out in the field at his old age. However, he still came equipped with dual hidden blades, as a symbol of their importance to the Assassin's Code, and also so he was never ill-equipped should he need to defend himself, with the hidden gun covering him for ranged attacks. We can see how Altair will evolve across the story, from the utilisation and differences between his outfits, and their evolution as he learns to step out from the shadow of al Mualim, and learns for himself what it means to be an Assassin. Speaking of which... Eleven ninety one. In the heart of the Third Crusade, we are introduced to Altair with a swift plunge of a blade. Alongside assassins Malik and his brother Kedar, Altair searches Solomon's temple for a sacred artifact, but its purpose is unknown. By starting the story in media res and establishing Altair as breaking the tenets of the creed. It catches the player up to speed with the rules the game will establish, through Altair failing to uphold them. This means you feel closer to Altair, as both you and him must work together to carry out your mission, by following the rules and both becoming more skilled in the process. An excellent skill. Fortune favours your blade. Not fortune, skill. Watch a while longer and you might learn something. Indeed. He'll teach you how to disregard everything the Masters taught us. And how would you have done it? I would not have drawn attention to us. I would not have taken the life of an innocent. What I would have done is follow the creed. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. Understand these words. It matters not how we complete our task, only that it's done. But this is not the way of- My way is better. I will scout ahead. Try not to dishonor us further. When Altair breaks the first tenant of the Creed by killing an innocent, we get two conflicting reactions. Kedar praises Altair for his efficient kill. Kedar seems to be new to the ways of the Creed, and still a wide-eyed rookie, as he doesn't understand the severity of what Altair just did, and it's up to Malik to correct Altair and reprimand his actions. Malik and Altair argue about their conflicting views on the way the Creed works. This is where the famous tagline, nothing is true, everything is permitted, is dropped for the first time. This is a phrase that will become a core part of the conflicting ideologies of the Creed, a sentiment that is so ripe for reinterpretation that the series will explain this quote in many ways. However, Altair expresses that he believes that as long as a job gets done, the methods of it should not be questioned. It matters not how we complete our task. 
only that it's done. But this is not the way of- My way is better. Malik, however, believes otherwise, that if their mission can be achieved by following the Creed, then Altair has no right to abandon it. This is where Altair expresses his main character's flaw, when he says that his way is better. Altair growing up as such a proficient and skilled assassin is ultimately what has led to him developing such a strong ego this early in his life. He needs to be humbled, or this master assassin could lead others astray in the future, as we can see happening now with Kirdar. As they push forward into the temple, they come across the Ark of the Covenant, the piece of Eden that they had come to retrieve, and once again, Altair and Malik butt heads, as Altair threatens to confront the Templar Knights that have beaten them there. Robert de Sable, his life is mine. No, we were asked to retrieve the treasure and deal with Robert only if necessary. He stands between us and it, I'd say it's necessary. Discretion, Altair! You mean cowardice. That man is our greatest enemy, and here we have a chance to be rid of him. You have already broken two tenets of our creed. Now you would break the third. Do not compromise the Brotherhood. I am your superior, in both title and ability. You should know better than to question me. We are told here about Robert de Sable, leader of the Knights Templar, and supposedly the Assassin's greatest threat. A man that Altair is fully determined to eliminate, and takes this as a priority over retrieving the Peace of Eden. As a result of this, Altair compromises the mission of the Brotherhood, and recklessly rushes in to kill Robert, leading to this encounter. Blood. No! You know not the things in which you meddle, Assassin. I swear you only that you may return to your master and deliver a message. The Holy Land is lost to him and his. He should flee now while he has the chance. Stay, and all of you will die. With Altair blocked off and the sounds of fighting behind him, it seems like he's made a bit of a shambles of the whole situation. Instead of finding a way back into the room, Altair runs away and finds a way out of the temple, returning to the assassin's stronghold in Masyaf to report back to his mentor, Al Mualim. When Altair returns, he finds he has a short interaction with Abbas. He returns at last. Abbas, where are the others? Did you ride ahead hoping to be the first one back? I know you are loath to share the glory. Silence is just another form of ascent. Have you nothing better to do? I bring word from the master. He waits for you in the library. Best hurry. No doubt you're eager to put your tongue to his boot. Another word and I'll put my blade to your throat. There'll be plenty of time for that later, brother. A character who many will know will take on a much larger role in Revelations. Almuelim puts Altair in his place, rightfully calling out his lies and excuses. However, as Malik returns not only alive but successful in retrieving the artifact, it becomes clear that Altair's methods and ego are not a great combination, and he needs taking down a peg. His actions have led to Kedar being killed, and Malik being crippled for life, now unable to be out in the field as an assassin anymore, because of Altair abandoning him. This is even worse, as now Robert de Sable is leading an attack on Masyaf, and Altair is required to defend his home. It's here that we see just how large a scale the consequences have been, and its effectiveness to show not only the small personal effects that this had on the two brothers, but also the escalation into a full scale on Armada. To show how unfazed Al Mualim is by this attack, he commands his assassins to jump from the Keep's Tower, as a supposed sacrifice without hesitation for the assassin cause, as an intimidation technique for Robert. My men do not fear death, Robert. They welcome it, and the rewards it brings. Good! Then they shall have it all around! Follow me, and do so without hesitation. 
Show this fool knight what it is to have no fear. Go to God! This is, however, just a trick, as the assassins, mainly, land unharmed, and sneak around the edges of the building for a surprise attack to drive away Robert's men. This illusion is a neat foreshadowing for the illusions Al Muellen will place under the people of Masyaf at the end of the game. He convinces the invading crusaders that there is a supernatural element to how the assassins operate, and while this might just be smoke and mirrors, it will become real magic by the game's conclusion. Also having Altair take the leap of faith, and trusting his life in the hands of the Creed, is almost an illusion in itself. Altair leaps knowing full well he is not committed to the assassin cause, and has a disliking for Al Mualim. Both these characters are lying about their commitment to faith. With Altair fending off the attacking crusaders, the memory skips forward to the aftermath, in which Altair is punished for disobeying the tenets of the Creed at Solomon's Temple. Do you know why it is you are successful? You listened! Were it that you'd listened in Solomon's temple, Altair, all of this would have been avoided. I did as I was asked. No, you did as you pleased. Malikas told me of the arrogance you displayed, your disregard for our ways. What are you doing? There are rules. We are nothing if we do not abide by the Assassin's Creed. Three simple tenets, which you seem to forget. Something you'll find with Assassin's Creed 1 in particular is that it isn't always subtle with its delivery of ideas or plot points. Take this interaction where Amoalem scolds Altair for his actions. There is a hefty amount of exposition for a very simple matter. We know Altair has broken the rules, but get quite a long scene recapping this when the groundwork was already laid, ending with Altair being stabbed and supposedly being reborn. I am sorry. Truly I am but I cannot abide a traitor. I am not a traitor. Your actions indicate otherwise, and so you leave me no choice. Peace be upon you, Altair. I am alive, but I saw you stab me, felt death's embrace. You saw what I wanted you to see. And then you slept the sleep of the dead, of the womb, that you might awake and be reborn. Upon Altair's spiritual rebirth, he is stripped of his rank and arsenal, left only as a novice of the Brotherhood, as he must now prove himself to be loyal to their weirs and relearn the tenets and meanings behind the Creed. This is a very straightforward arc for Altair, where he needs to learn to be more appreciative of others and stop being so selfish and it's one that we'll be visiting throughout the rest of the game. However, first of all, Altair is tasked to identify a traitor in the Assassin ranks, the one that allowed Robert de Sable into Masyaf. This acts as a tutorial for the process we'll be carrying out for the rest of the game. As has become infamous at this point, Assassin's Creed 1 follows a formula for the subsequent five memory blocks until the end. Some call it repetitive. This is... This is... This is... What? This is boring. But I think there's a lot of subtle character development shown throughout. This sequence introduces us to the Informer. I'm pretty sure this character is different in every city, but they are a recurring character that will interact with Altair and aid him in obtaining information on his targets. And by the end, you'll become quite attached to him, despite his characterization being rather low key. The, the traitor, you know who it is? Perhaps. Then give me a name and let's be done with it. That's not the way it works. Now go. This is where both the player and Altair can prove their skills early on, and locate the traitor using the investigation techniques Altair is already familiar with, within a safe environment. The traitor turns out to be my son. Not my son. My son, who had been influenced by the Templars and regrets nothing of his actions. Al Muallam makes an example out of him and explains to Altair that these are the sorts of men that will prolong the crusade through their corrupted wills. To renounce the evil in your heart. It is not evil in my heart. 
But truth, I will not repent. Then you will die. Which is a tad vague, and he tasks Altair to eliminate a total of nine men across the Holy Land to bring peace. Al Mualim's motivation is set on ending the Crusades, so the assassins can hide away in peace. At least, that appears to be the case for now. With this, Altair begins his quest. I've passed your test then. What now? <laughs> oh, my child. We've only just begun. I hold here a list. Nine names adorn it. Nine men who need to die. They are plague bringers, war makers. Their power and influence corrupts the land and ensures the Crusades continue. You will find them. Kill them. In doing so, you'll sow the seeds of peace, both for the region and for yourself. In this way, you might be redeemed. Until the final act of the game, the flow of the story will somewhat change as we follow the repetition of Altair speaking to Al Mualim, riding into a city, speaking to the leader of the respective bureau in that city, and then collecting information about his target. He will then return to the bureau, dump all of the knowledge he's learned as the best way to eliminate his target, before a set-piece mission will begin in which Altair will hunt his target and kill them. Personally, I actually enjoy this cycle of events, and it makes for quite a fun experience, as the cities progressively increase in difficulty, and the stakes become higher, showing how Altair's killings affect the city once he's left. These conversations aren't the most dynamic, and slow the pacing of the game to a crawl, so in an attempt to avoid this happening to the video, we may move through things a little quicker. Altair chases down this dude in the open, and this is bad because he was not stealthy. Okay, maybe not that quickly. I mentioned this in my Connor Kenway video, but since the game had such fantastic writing and characterization for its villains, I thought each one deserved their analysis. However, to quote past me, the best villains in the AC franchise are the ones that have a personal effect on the hero. As much as a lot of the targets in Assassin's Creed 1 had pages of dialogue from eavesdropping and pickpocketing, none of them have a personal dynamic with Altair. Their first interaction with him is when they are killed. Whilst these characters were monstrous, and left a profound impact on the Holy Land, because they didn't get in the way of Altair, it somewhat lessened their impact. This was quickly rectified in AC 2, even from the start, with Alberto being woven into Ezio's story, and being one of the most memorable kills for how he sells out Ezio's family. And not in the way that Ubisoft have. Arriving in Damascus, Altair goes to the Bureau, and is met by this guy. The leader comments on how other assassins have been talking about Altair behind his back, but he wouldn't care, since he's not much of an assassin anyway. A few of your brothers were here earlier, in fact. Oof, if you'd heard the things they said, I'm certain you'd have slain them where they stood. It's quite all right. Yes, you've never been one for the creed, have you? Altair then tracks down Tamiya, a weapons dealer Al Mualim would like to be taken off the board. <laughs> No. Leave the body. Let this be a lesson to the rest of you. Think twice before you tell me something cannot be done. Now get back to work. And... Be it. Upon killing Tamiya out in the open, he foreshadows that the other members of the Templar Order will now be aware of his absence, and that Altair's eight other targets are not random, but all connected. You'll come to know the others soon enough. They won't take kindly to what you've done. Good. I look forward to ending their lives as well. Such pride. It will destroy you, child. And that's pretty much it. Altair's character doesn't develop much here, aside from being inquisitive towards the conflict. Returning to the Bureau leader, he is pleased to hear of Altair's good work, and doesn't understand how the other assassins can think so little of him, perhaps already showing that Altair is beginning to change. Altair then returns to Al Mualim, where he is told the reason that Al Mualim kept the connection between these men secret was due to the oversharing of information being Altair's downfall in the past. 
a very convenient way of keeping his plans secret, and will certainly cause the player to start questioning things alongside Altair. The next target is in Irka, where we meet a new bureau leader, who is much older and less trusting of Altair. He doesn't get much characterization, and the conversations here are pretty uneventful. Altair's second target is a doctor, stealing patients from the city of Jerusalem for torture disguised as medical advancements. Enough, my child. I ask you to retrieve the patient, not to kill him. There, there. Everything will be all right. No! Give me no. your hand. Don't touch me! Not again! Cast out this fear, else I cannot help you. Help me? Like you helped the others? You took their souls! I saw! I saw! But not mine! No! You'll not have mine! Ah! It'll come back in time. Altair defends the lives of innocent people that he once had slain in Solomon's Temple, seeing now how bad their quality of life is. The Doctor was actually able to cure people with the Apple of Eden, fueling his medical knowledge, but now the assassins had stole it, he was unable to perform the same miracles, and resorted to botched attempts that left others tortured, making Altair question whether stealing the Apple of Eden was such a good idea after all. These are not children but men and women full-grown. In body, perhaps, but not in mind, which is the very damage I sought to repair. I admit, without the piece of Eden, which you stole from us, my progress was slowed. But there are herbs, mixtures, and extracts. My guards are proof of this. They were madmen before I found and freed them from the prisons of their own minds. <sighs> And with my death, madmen they will be again. You truly believe you are helping them? It's not what I believe, it's what I know. The next target is found in Jerusalem, where we are reintroduced to Malik. Now unable to operate as a field assassin, he's been downgraded to watching over the Bureau, and is naturally a little displeased to see Altair. Safety and peace, Malik. Your presence here deprives me of both. What do you want? Al Muallam has asked. Asked that you perform some menial task in an effort to redeem yourself. Malik knows that helping Altair will be helping the man that left his brother to die, but also by eliminating the Templar Talal, it will benefit the Order. However, Malik still rightfully suggests that Altair only carries out these tasks out of a selfish need for his rank and title back without fully understanding the effects that these killings have had on the balance of the war, something that Altair will need to prove to him over time. Talal works very similarly to the Doctor, showing off the importance of the first tenant of the Creed, to steer your blade from the flesh of the innocent. Talal is a slaver that kidnaps innocent people, and forces them into slavery overseas. Once again, Altair shows the value of human life, and that taking an innocent life makes him just as bad as this evil slave owner. Tracking down Talal's warehouse, he finds it an ambush, and has to take on Talal's men in combat. What is it you desire? Come down here. Let us settle this with honor. Why must it always come to violence? It seems I cannot help you, for you do not wish to help yourself, and I cannot allow my work to be threatened. You leave me no choice. You must die before chasing him out into the streets of Jerusalem, bringing attention to himself and not being particularly stealthy in his kill. This shows Altair to still not be entirely on top of every situation. He can still be beaten, and even though he gets the kill, he compromised his secrecy in the process. Malik is naturally furious at how Altair had carried out this task, worried that having him running around representing the assassins will do more harm than good in the long term. Entire city knows! Have you forgotten the meaning of subtlety? A skilled assassin ensures his work is noticed by the many. No! A skilled assassin maintains control of his environment. We can argue the details all you'd like, Malik, but the fact remains I've accomplished the task set to me by Al Muallim. Go then. Return to the old man. Let us see with whom he sides. You and I are on the same side, Malik. However, skipping forward a bit, because this target is just filler. 
Why have you done this? We meet with Malik again. He details how important the next target is, as the leaders of the conflict have left their positions to march to war, and in their absence, they have appointed new leaders for Altair to eliminate. The leader of Jerusalem, a power-hungry maniac, and a threat Malik warns should be taken more seriously by Altair. You speak too readily. This is not some slaver we're discussing. He rules Jerusalem and is well protected because of it. I suggest you plan your attack carefully. Get to better know your prey. And Altair responds by asking Malik for advice if that was the case. I think this naturally starts to show Altair becoming more selfless and appreciative of others. With your help, I will. Where would you have me begin my search? What's this? You're actually asking for my assistance instead of demanding it. At the same time, this chapter of the story has been focusing on Altair becoming slowly more suspicious of Al Mualim's intentions in giving him these tasks, and so begins to be more trusting of his fellow assassins as he looks for reassurance from them that his actions are justified. It seems when Altair is working for someone else, he becomes a lot more aware of the consequences when not in control of his actions. This could reflect how Altair has never been able to properly think for himself. However, this journey is helping him discover his true place as part of the Brotherhood, outside of the strict rule of Al Mualim, forming the friendships he hadn't prior and residing in others, even making amends for the ones that he hurt in the past. Here now are four filled with sin the harlot, the thief, the gambler, the heretic. Let God's judgment be brought down upon them all! I not lay down. Upon killing Madge, I think, Altair sees a dark reflection of himself. Madge enjoyed killing for power and sport, and being appointed leader of the city allowed him to enact a vicious rule. He's uncompromising and rejoices in the pain and suffering he brought others, something Altair admits to feeling at one point in his life, before learning the fate of those that led that life. Subtle. Alongside William of Montferrat, the theme of this memory block is the replacement leaders attempting to seize control of the abandoned cities, and claim them for the Templars the order that connects all these targets working under Rubber de Sable. Altair at this point feels like his queries have been answered, when Al Mualim reveals that all the targets are under Robert, in an attempt to keep Altair from digging further, however Altair knows that something is still wrong. The final two targets before Robert himself are in Acre and Damascus. In Acre, Altair meets with the Bureau leader for a final time, and confesses that he thought himself above the Brotherhood, but thanks to the help from the leaders in hunting his targets, he now sees the value in working together, which is some nice character development from the start, although done very subtly across the story, so that it's not one major event that changes Altair's perspective, but quite literally the repetition of tasks drumming into him the discipline that he needed. Sibrand was attempting to create a blockade around the port of Acre, that would stop any aid from getting through, when the Templars enacted their master plan. On a side note, while each assassination in the game is a massive breath of fresh air, in terms of the gameplay, this is my favourite in the game. The Port of Acre is a fantastic set piece, and a sprawling location with a diverse change of scenery, and even more of a threat since Altair can't swim. But Sibran still shines through, with his initial threats to the locals by killing a scholar simply for resembling Altair, but also the way he loses his marbles and starts firing his bow sporadically, showing how even the more skilled fighter can still give way to madness and fear. The people share my concern. What I do, I do for Arkle! Stay vigilant, men. Report any suspicious activity to the guard. I doubt we've seen the last of these assassins. Persistent bastards. Now get back to work. It's in this section of the game that you start to feel the power of the assassin. Well, would you look at that?
and how far Altair has come in terms of his raw abilities, now bestowed with a good majority of his arsenal and back to full strength. You don't believe. How could I, given what I know, what I've seen? Our treasure was the proof. Proof of what? That this life is all we have. There is no God! Jubier is the final target in Damascus, trying to burn all the books in the city in the dead of night, with his descendants so that the New World Order can rewrite history. Of course, Altair now values the knowledge and wisdom of the past, and so understands why Al Mualim would wish him dead. They are tools of learning. You turn to them for answers and salvation. You rely more upon them than yourselves. This makes you weak and stupid. You trust in words, drops of ink. Do you ever stop to think of who put them there? Or why? No, you simply accept their words without question. And what if those words speak falsely, as they often do? This is dangerous. You are wrong. These texts give the gift of knowledge. We need them. You love your precious writings? You do anything for them? Yes. Uh, yes, of course. Then join them! <laughs> In death, Jubert reveals that he found the books were tricking people into believing a lie and were keeping them obedient and away from the truth, something that heavily foreshadows Al Mualim's plot, and this also registers to Altair. With all eight men eliminated, we visit Al Mualim a final time to reflect on the men Altair has eliminated before his final mission. We are close. Only one more man stands between us and our ultimate goal. I will return to my work. The sooner this last man dies, the sooner I might face our true enemy. Before you go, I have a question for you. Of course. What is the truth? We place faith in ourselves. We see the world the way it really is, and hope that one day all mankind might see the same. What is the world, then? An illusion. One which we can either submit to, as most do, or transcend. What is it to transcend? To recognize nothing is true and everything is permitted. That laws arise not from divinity but reason. I understand now that our creed does not command us to be free. It commands us to be wise. Do you see now why the Templars are a threat? Whereas we would dispel the illusion, they would use it to rule. Yes, to reshape the world in an image more pleasing to them. That is why I sent you to steal their treasure. That is why I keep it locked away. And that is why you kill them. So long as even one survives, so too does their desire to create a new world order. It's only now that Altair has learned the error of his ways, and can truly understand Robert's motivation. He is attempting to unite the Holy Land all under one flag, to bring peace. But instead of doing this through nurturing the people, he instead aims to achieve this through control and depression, the ideals the Templars will continue to strive towards for nearly the next thousand years. It's up to Altair now to travel to Jerusalem and conclude the journey and put an end to this madness, but not before a final conversation with Malik. The and peace, Altair. Upon you as well, brother. Seems fate has a funny way with things. So it's true then. Robert de Sable is in Jerusalem. I've seen the knights myself. Only misfortune follows that man. If he's here, it's because he intends ill. I won't give him the chance to act. Do not let vengeance cloud your thoughts, brother. We both know no good can come of that. I have not forgotten. You have nothing to fear. I do not seek revenge, but knowledge. Truly, you are not the man I once knew. However, at the funeral, something seems off. As you know, this man was murdered. We have tried to track his killer, but it has proved difficult. These creatures cling to the shadows and run from any who would face them fairly. But not today, for it seems one stands among us. He mocks us with his presence and must be made to pay. Seize him! Bring him forward that God's justice might be done! 
As a red herring, Robert was never in Jerusalem, and the repetition of the mission structure reaches a subversion and ultimate payoff, as Altair is once again forced out into the open. Out of his comfort zone, you must fight off the waves of Crusader knights, before being able to reach Robert's decoy. None other than a woman named Maria, a character which will become a massive part of Altair's life going forward. But at this point, she represents how Altair has changed, and spares her life because she is truly an innocent pawn in Robert's game. His true location revealed to be marching for King Richard, attempting to sway him to the Templar cause. Ah, but it's not just Templars you'll contend with now. Speak sense. Robert rides for Arthur to plead his case that Saracen and Crusader unite against the Assassins. That will never happen. They have no reason to. Had, perhaps. But now you've given them one. Nine, in fact. The bodies you've left behind, victims on both sides. You've made the Assassins an enemy in common and ensured the annihilation of your entire order. Well done. Not nine. Eight. What do you mean? You are not my target. I will not take your life. You're free to go, but do not follow me. I don't need to. You're already too late. We'll see. Altair must rush to the city of Arsuf, fighting his way through platoons of soldiers just to get to King Richard's location. Robert's master plan to unite the Holy Land was not to use the Apple of Eden, but to create a common enemy, which aligns all sides of the war. Since Altair has killed men on all sides, the assassins are that target. Is this true? My liege, it is an assassin that stands before us. These creatures are masters of manipulation. Of course it isn't true. I've no reason to deceive. Oh, but you do. You're afraid of what will happen to your little fortress. Can it withstand the combined might of the Saracen and the Crusader army? My concern is for the people of the Holy Land. If I must sacrifice myself for there to be peace, so be it. What do you intend? Surely you do not believe him? It is a difficult decision, one I cannot make alone. I must leave it in the hands of one wiser than I. Thank you. No, Robert, not you. Then who? The Lord. Let this be decided by combat. Surely God will side with the one whose cause is righteous. If this is what you wish. It is. So be it. To arms, assassin. Upon defeating Robert in combat, he reveals an even bigger red herring, and one that will change Altair's world forever. It is revealed that there is, in fact, a tenth man on the list. The final Grand Master pulling the strings behind even Robert was Al Mualim. The only other man to know of the Apple's power, wiping the Templars off the board so he alone could control the masses using the Peace of Eden to enslave them. Ironically, both Altair and Robert were protecting each other from Al Mualim's control, and now the Nine had fallen. His plan was ready to begin. Where is everyone? Gone to see the Master. Was it the Templars? Did they attack again? They walk the path. What path? What are you talking about? Towards the light. Speak sense. There is only what the Master shows us. This is the truth. Returning to Masyaf to confront Al Mualim, we see a very different shift in tone as Masyaf's colour palette has become incredibly desaturated, and the village has been abandoned. Only a lone informer remains who appears possessed. This is where we slowly get a glimpse into the world Al Mualim is trying to create. As Altair works his way up to the keep, he's confronted by his fellow assassins, now bewitched. They attempt to kill him, forcing Altair to retaliate. This is a fantastic representation of how Altair's feelings towards the Brotherhood have changed along his journey. He may have started the game disregarding their lives, but now it's a gut punch to have to kill them, after he's grown to value them so much through helping out the Informers and the Bureau leaders. The Informers helped Altair scope out his targets in the city. They were novices of the Creed, yes, but they managed to get the information Altair needed, 
and match that with how the Bureau leaders steered Altair in the right direction, and you can see how the supporting characters in the game have all served to push the emotional weight of this finale. Of course, the story comes full circle when Malak and his remaining men save Altair from the attackers, and here we get a wonderful exchange. It's taken a lot of time to get to it, but this is where the payoffs all come in one go, and it makes the pacing of this finale fantastic, as we see the payoff of Altair's connection to the Brotherhood back to back with his redemption in the eyes of Malik, with a great line that mimics their first encounter. Though he has betrayed the tenets of the Creed, it does not mean we must as well. I'll do what I can. It's all I ask. Safety and peace, my friend. Your presence here will deliver us both. Altair may have left him to die initially, but over the months tracking the Templars, he's shown to have seen growth, and a regret for what happened. He proves that people can always change, and no matter how much he trained, his heart needed to be in the right place to work as a team, and the repetition of the gameplay acts as a lesson for the player too, become more familiar with how the structure of the game is carried out. Finally reaching the keep, we see where the people of the village have been hiding, frightened of what's been going on in their homes. Showing the massive crowd before going to confront Al Mualim sets up the stakes. The game makes you push your way through and interact with these people you know could be hurt if you don't succeed. The game started with Altair killing an innocent, so it's only right that at the end, he has to save them. Reaching the courtyard, Altair is stopped in his tracks by his master, and comes face to face with the real threat to the Holy Land. So, his student returns. I've never been one to run. Uh, never been one to listen, either. I still live because of it. What will I do with you? Using the Apple of Eden, Al Mualim wants to enslave the world. He simply needed Altair to eliminate all of the Templars that had a chance of stopping him. During the fight with him, he uses the Apple of Eden to summon illusions of the nine men you've had to eliminate across the course of the story, pitting Altair against them as you once again cement your decisions to kill them, and prove that your cause is right. It's fitting that part of Altair's journey is eventually overcoming the restrictions Al Mualim placed on him, and truly coming to his own as a leader the assassins can follow, which is excellently established with Malik. You can see the seeds of a new brotherhood under Altair, which only Al Mualim's old ways of thinking would get in the way of. Of course, after a boss fight in which you play hide and seek, Altair is successful. Impossible. The student does not defeat the teacher. <laughs> So it seems. You have won then. Go and claim your prize. You held fire in your hand, old man. It should have been destroyed. Destroy the only thing capable of ending the Crusades and creating true peace? Never. Then I will. We'll see about that. This is where Assassin's Creed 1 ends, with a cliffhanger that ends up being more focused on a modern day conclusion than Altair's character, and in fact leaving quite a lot left open. The only thing we get reassurance on is that the plot to enslave the people in the Holy Lands has been foiled. However, we're still left with Altair and the Peace of Eden, and the choice to either take it or destroy it. Of course, these questions would be answered in Assassin's Creed Revelations, but let's wrap up here first. I... I can't. Yes, you can, Altair. But you won't. Altair's story in Assassin's Creed 1 may be a little bit basic and cover a typical redemption arc, but I think the way it's executed is what makes it so good. Because of how many characters the game has, with the informers and the bureau leaders, it's always left unclear just how far Altair is coming along, because some people will love him or hate him, and never all at the same time, which makes his humbling appear to occur so much more naturally. By making him so unapologetically unlikable at the start, it makes the closing chapter of the game feel like we've gone on the same journey as Altair, 
the way his changes are incorporated so naturally by making you as the player carry out missions to help the informers and learn the tenets of the creed. Not only make it an excellent blend between character and player, but also immerses you more in the world of Assassin's Creed, and keeps you invested throughout. The game from start to finish is about Altair's redemption. It's how the game starts and ends, and any events before or after are not a concern, which outlines clearly the intentions of the game to make you feel more like an assassin yourself as you climb up the ranks. Now I may have skipped out on some parts and overlooked some of the villains in the game, but it's only because of the perspective this video is taking. I enjoy learning more about these characters and how their plans will unfold through learning more information about them in gameplay and seeing the physical effect they will have on the environment. It's fantastic storytelling, which has rarely been recaptured due to the replayability of open worlds in later games. The problem lies in the Templar's connection to Altair. From doing these character studies, I've noticed a pattern with how the dialogue is usually handled, and the problem here is that the Templars will spout out the exposition and challenge the Creed's way of being, which is perfectly fine, but the problem is that they don't know anything about Altair, so it never seems personal or very engaging. For example, the Templars in Assassin's Creed 3 are all older than Connor, so they instantly assume they are smarter than him, calling him boy and shaking their heads at anything he says, because they believe he's simply too stupid to understand. These subtle ways of getting conversation flowing help massively in creating conflict. The only characters that leave a mark are the ones that suggest Altair should be more inquisitive before he follows everything Al Mualim tells him, which is usually followed by a paragraph of exposition, and upon questioning Al Mualim, we are given yet another paragraph of exposition, and let's be honest, the presentation of Al Mualim's conversations with Altair is so restricted that many players are just going to go on their phone or zone out until they're allowed to move again, which is probably why this flat camera angle conversation was scrapped in future titles, in favour of full cinematic cutscenes. Now as I said, this isn't the end of Altair's character, as he would make a spectacular return in Assassin's Creed Revelations as Ezio attempted to breach the Masyaf stronghold and learn all of Altair's secrets, along the way acquiring discs that acted similarly to the Animus and showed Ezio a glimpse of the memories that made up important events in Altair's life. And I will not make a joke about the events of AC1 not being in any of them. This gives us five exclusive missions as Altair, showing his entire life both a glimpse before and after Assassin's Creed 1. But that's not all. Right from the first revealed trailer of Assassin's Creed Revelations, which by the way, is the best one they've ever done, it paints Altair in a different light, one of mystery. As Ezio travels further into Masyaf, he sees glimpses of Altair watching him from afar, a ghost that Ezio is taken aback by. I think this is a great way of letting us know early on, although you thought you understood Altair, that's all about to change, and he still has many secrets left to tell, which as Ezio, we will uncover with him. If you're a fan of the modern day, then I think this concept is cool, like an animus within an animus. We watch Desmond watch Ezio watch Altair, and Altair doesn't even know the impact his story is having on all these different journeys. Altair's ghost will guide Ezio during his time in Masyaf, during the first level of the game as a sort of tutorial, before we discover what his purpose in the story will be. To breach Altair's great library and gain his dying secrets, Ezio must recover five discs, containing Altair's genetic memories. These are key moments in Altair's life, recorded onto the discs so that those that fully understood the life Altair lived would be granted access to his final secrets. Mission 1 is set two years before the events of the first game, and acts as a retcon of sorts of Altair's personality, as we join him in the middle of a Crusader attack on Masyaf. Are you hurt? Mm. Broken foot. It seems one of the assassins has betrayed the Order, and Altair must pick up the pieces. If this was Altair from the first game, then we would assume that his not caring for following the tenets of the Creed would make him messy and lead to a poor handling of the situation. However, 
throw that knowledge aside, and for now just take this version of Altair as a separate character, or a reinterpretation through Ezio's eyes, for some kind of reasoning as to why Altair is shown immediately to help his fellow assassin in combat. This shows Altair to have been a master of his craft at such a young age, and be able to fend off an army of Templars without any casualties, if you completed the optional objectives. When Altair reaches the top of the mountain, he's confronted by the traitor, and goodness me, is that an, a Templar? With an actual connection to our main character? Dynamics? Crazy! You will not leave this place alive, traitor. No, you misunderstand. I am no traitor. Well, I cannot betray those I never truly love. Then you are doubly wretched, but you have been living a lie. This is already a massive improvement, as we learn more through Altair through his villains, as he says, I cannot betray those I never truly loved. I believe this opening mission not only demonstrates Altair's skills, but plays on the pre-existing knowledge we already have of Altair. Because we know Al-Mualim is a traitor, there is an irony in having to save him, and by confronting a man who doesn't care for the Brotherhood, and will happily kill assassins for fun, we can compare this character with Altair, letting his fellow assassins die in Solomon's temple. Altair is of course successful by hiding in plain sight, using his knowledge of the castle walls to his advantage, and being able to land an air assassination on the Templar Knight, from a vantage point where he could have been easily seen this whole time, had this traitor stopped focusing on the hostages and looked for Altair himself. Which is another commentary on the guy's ego. You put too much faith in the hearts of men, Altair. The Templars know the truth. Humans are weak, base, and petty. No. Our creed is evidence to the contrary. Uh, perhaps I am not wise enough to understand, but I suspect the opposite. That I am too wise to believe such rubbish. In this confession scene, that, no that's right, we're actually talking about a confession scene, he speaks of how trusting other men will get you killed, and it's better to control them, instead to get what you want. This is a reflection on both Altair and Al Mualim, as Al Mualim will later use the Apple of Eden to control the masses, since he lost faith in his assassins being able to make a difference. Meanwhile, Altair in Assassin's Creed 1 feels himself above the other assassins, and only trusts himself to get the job done. It's possible that upon hearing from a Templar that there is another way for the world to work, it would have made him hesitate and planted the seeds that led to his ego a few years later. It would have been nice to have a mission that explores the turmoil Altair had during his time in Assassin's Creed 1, in a bit more depth, but it seems Revelations is less concerned about tampering with Assassin's Creed 1's story, and simply builds its narrative around the events of it, as a separate story which allows it to fit in well. When returning to real time, Altair and Al Mualim talk about why Altair offered the traitor a chance to live. You offered him a chance to salvage his dignity. Why? No man should pass from this world without knowing some kindness. But he shunned your graces, as was his right. Altair, I have watched you grow from a boy to a man in so short a time. It fills me with as much sadness as pride. Altair states that it was the traitor's right to question the creed, and he had the patience to answer him with his beliefs, and show him both kindness and respect in death. This shows the emotional maturity Altair has compared to the hot-headed attitude that Ezio or Connor would have had in the same confrontation. You too were born into this order. Do you regret it? How can I regret the only life I've ever known? You may find a way in time and it will be up to you to choose the path you prefer. Al Mualim asks a fantastic question here. Does Altair regret the life he has? Now this would have been a phenomenal question to be asked in Assassin's Creed 1, and I'm sure a very different answer would have been given. But Altair does give a fantastic response here too, saying that he can't regret the only life he's ever known. If Altair was unaware of what life outside the Creed offered, how could he know if it was a blessing or a curse to have been raised under the Brotherhood? 
Alma Wallen stays in character too, by acknowledging that Altair is different from the others, and he can see in time that Altair will outlive the Brotherhood, and be given a chance at a life outside of it. This is the Alma Wallen we needed to see more of in Assassin's Creed 1, as it explains why he had such a fondness for Altair, more than him being just an effective killer, but instead feeling guilty for the life he forced him down, and wanting to give him his own free will to choose. I think it's for this reason that we get the impression of Al Mualim being soured by the Apple of Eden. It's not just his secret lust for power that drives him to attack the Holy Land, but the Apple's abilities to control minds and corrupt wills, also affecting Al Mualim's, while it sat in his study for those few months, causing him to lose genuine feelings and become trapped by its power. And as we've seen later retconned in the tyranny of King Washington, the Apple of Eden does indeed have some sort of negative influence on its own. This mission ends with Al Mualim and Altair on good terms, which is really nice to see. Unfortunately, then the entirety of Assassin's Creed 1 occurs. Set immediately after AC1's cliffhanger ending, we finally find out what happened after Al Mualim's death. The memory starts by giving us a recollection of Al Mualim and Altair's final words to each other now dubbed over by Altair's new voice actor. I haven't mentioned Altair's voice much, but he was given an American accent in AC1, despite actor Philip Chavez initially using a Middle Eastern accent during his audition and in early recordings, which you can still find on YouTube. This was changed so that Altair would stand out more from his peers, and you would be able to relate with him more. However, it did result in a lot of raised eyebrows, as it certainly doesn't line up with the 100% historical accuracy the game had in mind. When approaching Revelations, the team were able to bring back Al Mualim's original voice in Peter Renadier, but Shabazz did not return as Altair, which could be due to the criticism of his American accent being used. Cass Anver now voices Altair, and seems like a better pick for accuracy, as Anvar's parents were Iranian, and yet still it seems like Anvar's performance lines up similarly to those original recordings Shabazz did, without an American accent, giving it some sense of consistency. You can also see the mannerisms in their voices are nearly identical, especially now you can compare both versions of Altair's final words to his mentor. You held fire in your hand, old man. It should have been destroyed. You held fire in your hand, old man. It should have been destroyed. When approached by his fellow assassins now free from Al Mualim's control, he refers to their mentor as Sorcerer, which Altair is quick to correct. Al Mualim may have been capable of much evil, but that did not elevate his status, and should not be remembered as the god he sought to be. He was just a man with too much control, like any other. Altair is now in fitting with his AC1 counterpart as his first instinct is to ride to Jerusalem and Acre and inform the Bureau leaders that helped him of the events that transpired. Altair then runs into Abbas. Abbas is instantly hesitant towards Altair, and asks to see proof of Al Mualim's crimes. You can hear in his voice not only hesitation, but hostility. What has happened here? Our mentor deceived us all. The Templars corrupted him. Where is your proof? Walk with me, Abbas and I will explain. Now Altair has been humbled, we can see him make an effort to keep the peace between his fellow assassins. As they walk, it's clear that Abbas is still untrusting of Altair, and recalls the events of Solomon's Temple, and Altair's selfishness prior. It's understandable that in life there will be some people that will never believe you can change, and Abbas doesn't want to take any chances, when it's clear Al Mualim's leadership was more important to him, and Altair killing him after expressing feelings of being better than the assassins would lead to some concern. However, they do seem to be willing to talk things out, until... Altair! No! I must know that he cannot return. But this is not our way. To burn a man's body is forbidden. Defiler! Hear me out. This body could be another one of Al Mualim's phantoms. I must be certain. Lies! All your life, you have made a mockery of our creed. You bend the rules to suit your whims, while belittling and humiliating those around you. Restrain him! Did you not hear him? Al Mualim is bewitched. It's at this moment that a power struggle begins for leadership over the assassins. 
those that believe Altair had truly changed, and those who did not. As a sequel story, this premise is really good, because it challenges and questions the integrity of Altair's journey, and having Altair wake up from his fall in the middle of the assassins fighting does a lot to show that there is a lot of healing yet to be done. Did I tell you, Altair? Abbas, stop! What did you think would happen when you murdered our beloved mentor? You loved and believed less than anyone. You blamed him for all your misfortune, even your father's suicide. My father was a hero. This is not the time to quarrel over the past. We must decide what to do with that weapon. Whatever this artifact is capable of, you are not worthy to wield it. No man is. Is it not? Ah! The situation escalates even further, as now Abbas has recovered the Apple of Eden from the keep, and is attempting to use it before Altair can get his hands on it, with disastrous consequences, as he begins torturing the people below, out of his control. You can see for a brief moment a string of light go from the apple to Abbas's head. In Issy Brotherhood, when you use the apple in combat, it would damage Ezio in the process, as overexposure to its powers could kill the user, and this seems to be happening to Abbas, as he has unknowingly began charging up the apple's power, and the output could kill him in the process. Altair is the only one with a strong enough will to resist the apple, as seen with Al Mualim. Therefore, he's the only one who can save Abbas. Despite Abbas being his enemy, I do feel like it's in character for Altair to save him. I can't see Altair leaving another assassin to die like he did with Malik's brother. When Altair reaches the top, we can see that Abbas was also being tortured, and he wasn't trying to hurt anyone with this attack. He simply couldn't comprehend the apple's power until it was in his own hands. Here is where we pick up from the question asked at the end of AC1. Would you take the apple? Although Altair has said earlier that no man should ever wield it, Abbas has proven that if people know of its existence, they will always try to take it. Also, it is a more interesting line of thought to explore somebody that did take the apple as opposed to Altair simply leaving it be. Mission 3 starts with establishing a time skip. This is now 10 years later, and Altair no longer lives in Masyaf with the assassins but instead has run away with the apple and his now wife Maria Thorpe. Maria is the woman who was posing as Roberta Sabler in AC1, and was brought back in AC2, in a brief flash where the bleeding effect accidentally sends Desmond back to Altair's memories, without being in the Animus. As a quick bit of lore that establishes a relationship between the two, giving us an explanation on how Altair's bloodline continued. This is now greatly expanded upon, and gives Altair a love interest, and a more human reason for him to leave the assassins behind. Unfortunately, this now leaves Abbas as mentor, and Altair separated from Masyaf. Although, he is still wearing assassin robes, so I'm not too sure what's going on there. He speaks to Maria about how Abbas has been doing a less than stellar job, and keeping the Brotherhood thriving, and has led to the Templars recapturing an archive in Cyprus, despite Altair being the one to capture it originally in the PSP game Assassin's Creed Bloodlines. That spin-off is set after the events of AC1, by about a month, and so canonically would fit in before this mission and before the AC2 one. In fact, here's a timeline I've created if you want to see Altair's life in order. Bloodlines goes into more detail on what happened to bring Altair and Maria together, and what happened to the Templars after the events of the first game. It's not great, I mean, look at it. But it ends with the Templars being driven away from the Cyprus Archive, which ties neatly into the conversation Altair is now talking to Maria about, as it's something that holds significance to both of them. Fun fact, this is also the same archive Ezio would explore between AC Brotherhood and Revelations, finding it to be abandoned which means that the Templars were either driven away again, or simply left it be. We find out that Abbas has caused the death of Altair's youngest son, leading Altair to spiral and seek revenge on Abbas by murdering him, which is a massive leap from the last time we saw him, but the added context makes us understand why Altair would suddenly switch. 
He trusted Abbas to be the leader he couldn't be, but by giving that responsibility to another, it has led to chaos. The only way Altair can save the Brotherhood is to do it by honourable means, so he meets instead with Abbas to talk things out. And reasonable men will listen. Some will, but not Abbas. I should have expelled him 30 years ago when he tried to steal the apple. But you earn the respect of the other assassins because you let him stay. How do you know this? You are not there. I married a masterful storyteller. Look at this place. Masyaf is a shadow of its former self. We have been away for a long time. But not in hiding. The Mongol threat demanded our attention and we rode to meet it. What man here can say the same? Although it's been 10 years since Altair left Masyaf, it has been 30 years since al Mualim's death, and so this massive chunk of time has caused Altair to grow bitter. Along with the knowledge that Altair has owned the apple the whole time, despite being immune, we still have to question how his mind has been distorted by the apple since acquiring it. Also, Altair has two hidden blades now, which is a really subtle way of implying that he's already used the apple to look into the future, as it was Aguilar, for some fucking reason, that was known as the first assassin to use two hidden blades. No, really, genuinely, that, that's actually canon. Let them speak. We seek the truth about our son's death. Why was Seth killed? Is it the truth you want? Or an excuse for revenge? If the truth gives us an excuse, we will act on it. Surrender the apple, Altair, and I will tell you why your son was put to death. Ah, the truth is out already. Abbas wants the apple for himself, not to open your minds, but to control them. You have held that artifact for 30 years, Altair, reveling in its power and hoarding its secrets. It has corrupted you. It seems Abbas is still too stubborn to listen to Altair, and their conversation gives the impression that they had already had it before, without either giving in or listening to reason. Although you could theorise that Abbas may have killed Altair's son as a trap to draw him out and steal the apple, after already having a taste of its power. Altair says that he will let Abbas take the apple, but as his man approaches and taunts Altair over the death of his son, Altair snaps and uses the apple on him. It does make you wonder whether Altair was legitimately going to hand over the apple to Abbas, or if he and Maria had the plan to overthrow him there and then. This confrontation does take place in the same location as the final fight with al Mualim, which can't be a coincidence. Unfortunately, Altair's snapping leads to Maria getting in the way and being killed, essentially being fridged to give Altair a reason to lash out. I'm sorry Maria, you deserved a better character. In the cutscene, we know Altair kills one of the assassins, which is marked as his betrayal, and gets him cast out from Masyaf forever. But in the gameplay, <laughs> assassins can now be killed and not just disarmed. So if your canon is that Altair went on a murder spree, then you can certainly make that a reality. Whilst Altair is escaping, his son Darium meets him, and Altair speaks of how Maria is dead, and how Abbas is responsible for the deaths of his brother Seth and Malik. Father, I got your message. What has happened? That him! Turn back! Have they all gone mad? We have to go. Abbas must not get his hands on the apple. Was it Abbas who killed my brother? He killed your brother, Malik, and countless others. He is a madman. A madman with an army. He will die. One day he will pay. It's nice to see that Malik gets a name drop here, but such a shame that he is simply a casualty of Abbas's rule. This was the moment I truly started to hate Abbas, because of how he'd killed certainly the most sympathetic character in the first game. I think it's because of the lie that Abbas's father had been killed instead of suicide that caused this inner rage in Abbas, and made him so controlling and manipulative. I think due to the gaps between these missions, Abbas can come across as a bit one note, but he has the motivation there for him to be a formidable threat. It's also nice that he isn't just a reflection of what Altair could have turned out like, which would have been the easy answer, but instead a consequence of his father's actions, and something Altair couldn't have helped. 
taking the power to save Abbas's father out of Altair's hands, makes Abbas more of a tragic character, because nothing could have saved him from the man he has now become. The only thing that can be taken away, however, is his power. I will have the apple, Altair, and I will have your head for all the dishonor you brought upon my family. You cannot run forever, not from us, and not from your lies. Mission 4 picks up another 30 years later, a massive gap considering that Altair was in his 50s in the previous mission. Now at 82, an old Altair, robed in rags, sits with a group of young assassins by a campfire, outside of Masyaf. These assassins will have grown up without knowing a rule outside of Abbas's, and so they think his crazy methods are normal, but still, some question if he has truly lost his way, with rumours of his past keeping him awake at night. What brings you here, old man? Pity Abbas. Do not mock him. He has lived as an orphan for most of his life, shaped by his family's legacy. He is desperate for power, because he is powerless. He is our mentor, and unlike Al Mualim or Al Tair, he never betrayed us. Nonsense. Al Tair was no traitor. He was driven out unjustly. <laughs> Al Tair has had 30 years away from the Brotherhood, still wielding their blades. He has come to peace with what happened to his family. It took time for his bloodlust to subside, but now he has lived his life with only one looming regret. To save the Brotherhood. In Altair's absence, Abbas has resorted to using outside mercenaries to keep the stronghold safe, and so there are a few left that are true assassins, but those that are known of Altair's wrongful banishing help Altair to work his way up to the top of the castle. The ones that have broken the tenets of the creed are eliminated along the way, as Altair has no remorse for those that kill innocents. This shows how much Altair has changed, to the point where, in his old age, he's come to resent the person that he was, and probably that Al Mualim of all people was the one to give him a second chance, but Altair does not share the same remorse. On his way up, we see the glimpses of the ghost of Maria, reminding Altair of what he's lost on the way, and why he's there. Now when I was a wee child playing Assassin's Creed 1, I thought all of the informers were the same character, and during this sequence in Revelations, I accidentally mistook Maria's ghost for that of the informers. And so, until making this very video, I've always thought that the ghostly figures that appear on Altair's journey to the keep were the informer, guiding Altair one last time before we discover their fate at the end. And while a reference to the informer would have been cool considering Malik got name dropped, I was a bit disappointed to find out that it's just Maria. Altair, <sighs> two decades have passed since we last saw you within these walls. We could use your wisdom, now more than ever. I love this note here with the final captain, where he initially seems hostile towards Altair before saying how much they need him. It's a great way of showing how all of the assassins are finally free, to confess their disapproval towards Abbas, and how Altair is the person they need to help them overthrow him. I love how this whole time, Abbas believes Altair has used the apple to bewitch the people, because he is so far gone that he can't believe Altair has been able to rally the assassins to his cause without needing any trickery. It answers the question of whether Altair would take the apple back in his 20s, with the reassurance that he wouldn't have to. Tell your men to stand down. No, I am defending Masyaf. Would you not do the same? You corrupted everything we stand for and lost everything we gained. All of it sacrificed on the altar of your own spite. And you, you have wasted your life staring into that apple, dreaming of your own glory. That is true, Abbas. I learned many things from the apple, of life and death, of the past and the future. Let me show you. Few moments in Assassin's Creed 1 make you go, oh shit, that's fucking cool. 
but the cinematic evolution of the franchise to movie-level performances and cutscenes allow for such a perfect combination of events, in which the prompt to use the gun collectively made me lose my shit. The idea that Altair used the Apple of Eden to look into the future and see how the blade would evolve in a way that could make him deadly even at his old age, only to see Leonardo da Vinci craft the hidden gun for Ezio, then for Altair to make his own in the 13th century is such a domino effect of setups that it truly earns its place as the climax to this conflict between Abbas and Altair, the peak of where this story has been heading. He reclaimed his honor. I hope there is another life after this one. Then I will see him and know the truth of his final days. And when it is your time, we will find you. And then there will be no doubts. With a tremendous bang, Altair is now in his rightful place as mentor, and unlike the dark cloaked Al Mualim, Altair proudly displays his journey and his purity with his mentor robes. Mission 5 acts as a sort of swan song farewell that showcases some of the fun lore that we've heard about Altair from previous games, and ends his dedicated missions on a lighter note. Altair has now been a mentor for 10 years, and we see the assassins are back on form and happily welcoming visitors back into the keep. Here we meet Niccolo Polo, who is handed the codex from Altair. These 30 pages will later go on to be used in AC2, to show the location of the Peace of Eden, and also document all of Altair's findings across his years studying the Apple. Many of these discoveries led to upgrades in weapons to be used by Ezio, so giving us a payoff to its introduction, by showing how the pages got to Italy, is a fantastic payoff. Whilst this mission is short and doesn't offer much in terms of dialogue, there is one great monologue from Altair at the end, which sums up how this mission has been. end of an era. When I was very young, I was foolish enough to believe that our creed would bring an end to all these conflicts. If only I had possessed the humility to say to myself, I have seen enough for one life. I have done my part. Then again, there is no greater glory than fighting to find the truth. We are ready. When Altair was young, he believed he could resolve the conflict in the Holy Lands within his lifetime, that killing nine Templars would save the deer, and he could live a separate life afterwards. But now at 92, he has yet to see an end to the struggle between the Assassins and Templars. All he's ever wanted was peace, and now he finally has it, but not in the way he expected. The Apple has shown Altair to carry his story in the Discs of Eden as a message for Ezio. That message is a warning for Ezio not to do the same. Whilst Altair gave his all to restore the Brotherhood at such an old age, he kept pushing because he knew there was so much left to do, but unfortunately not enough time to do it. In Assassin's Creed 1, Altair was selfish, and thought only he was skilled enough to complete a task. And now we see that carry through his entire life. We see a man who thought that he had to do everything to completion, and now he teaches others to do the opposite to trust in others, to continue your work. There will be mistakes like Abbas, but the right people will prevail. You just need to learn to let go. Niccolo is tasked with establishing an assassin bureau in Constantinople, and from there he will return to Italy, where we will see Ezio's story pick up from, tying them both together. However, there is a sixth key, and one that resides with Altair in the present. Within Altair's library, Ezio opens the door using the first five keys, only to find that it's empty. There are no books or wisdom to be learned, only the body of Altair in its centre, and another disc with his final memories. The final memory starts by giving us the biggest reveal of all, what Altair's hair looks like. 
Darren begins to question Altair as he stands outside the library, now revealed to be a vault to contain the apple from the Mongols once they reach Masyaf, but Altair quickly stops him and spares him a lengthy explanation, by relaying what's really important here, to leave the assassins and live his own life. A life that Altair never did. The assassins at this point have spread out amongst the rest of the world, and the legacy is now secured. All that is left for Altair to do is to ensure the apple never falls into the wrong hands, still believing it to be the only one in existence. As Altair walks into the library, we hear echoes of Al Mualim, talking about how the wiser you are, the more sorrow and existential dread it brings followed by Maria asking Altair frantic questions about the apple, and how secure their future could be. It's clear that Altair felt a great sense of responsibility with the amount of knowledge he'd been bestowed, but still couldn't make sense of it enough to reassure her. Finally, we hear Altair crying out for Maria, similar to how Abbas was supposedly crying out for his father, a pattern that couldn't be allowed to repeat itself. Finally letting go of the apple, Altair sits and rests, knowing he has played his part. This is where we transition back to Ezio, who follows Altair's instructions and lets go, giving up his role as an assassin and retiring from the Brotherhood to go and live the life he didn't realise he needed. For only six appearances in the game, Altair's character is given the most phenomenal development, tying him into the very foundations of the law. It's a credit to the writing that his character from AC1 is preserved and given a natural stepping stone that is so unique from every other character in the series, because it's done retrospectively, as part of a bigger overarching theme of the game split between three characters. AC Revelations is just as much Altair's game as it is Ezio's. You may play as Ezio significantly more, and Desmond gets a hell of a lot more development, but Altair is the heart of the story. It's his message that is the moral for Ezio to learn. Ezio is more a messenger delivering this to Desmond, which is more in keeping with Ezio's role in general. It's all interwoven in a way that makes it feel planned from the start. They could have so easily just remade some set pieces from Assassin's Creed 1 with cutscenes and improved graphics and just stuck them in there for nostalgia, but it's amazing how far they push Altair's character to his absolute limit. Altair goes through hardships and strong moral questioning, he stumbles and makes mistakes, and has to live with those for his entire life, and at the end of it all, he doesn't regret it, because as he says early on, he can't regret the only life he's ever known. Unlike those before and after, he was an assassin from his birth until his death. The character of Altair is told in two halves. The first Assassin's Creed game was still trying to define the assassins as a concept, and so wanted Altair to be the cold-blooded and merciless killer you would associate with the assassin archetype in media. However, as the franchise evolved quickly and found its footing with Ezio, you can see how the second half of Altair's story makes him more relatable and gives him more human struggles. The redemption story of Assassin's Creed 1 is simple, but conveyed with subtlety, and played genuinely so that you find yourself attached to Altair as if you had risen through the ranks of an assassin and became a master yourself. Revelations then takes this power level and questions what a man should do with this kind of power. It challenges the notion of what you've achieved and dissects it, as being one that no human could happily live with. Altair's story is filled with loss from his family to his time. He felt an oppressive sense of responsibility from his possession of the Apple of Eden, and gave his entire life to securing a future for the Brotherhood, in the hopes that one day the conflict will end. But he doesn't do it reluctantly, but still with his head held high. And he never slips into a bitter man, but one that has come to terms with his place in the world, and is satisfied in knowing that he's given others a better life because of it. When people say Altair is the goat, this game is the one that gives you a reason to believe it. He is not the most relatable or funny, you don't find yourself crying over his loss particularly, but he has this sense of grandeur, wisdom and prestige. His legacy is being felt even to this day, with Assassin's Creed Mirage being a pseudo remake of the first game, there's a heavy possibility that Altair will be alluded to, 
and if we did see Basim deliver the Apple of Eden to Solomon's temple, I could certainly see myself getting chalked up at seeing the pieces set in motion for Altair and his fantastically tall journey, from disgraced novice to mentor of the Brotherhood. What did you think of Altair? Do you see him as underrated or overrated? I don't think there's really an in-between, just due to how fans perceive his characterisation, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, because I'm certainly very biased. I love the first Assassin's Creed game, even though I'll admit the storytelling isn't very strong in my opinion. It's Revelations where my love for Altair comes through, but running around Acre or Damascus is always a joy and from a design perspective, I have to say that he has my favourite robes in the series. There's just something about the simplicity and the slight asymmetry that I just love. The bottom of his robes opening up is a particular favourite of mine. I want to thank you all for watching this video and I hope to see you soon. Where we'll be making our own look.